My favorite bit was near the beginning of the book, there is a fan club for the show that has a meeting mm -hmm. and they have to sing the the song of the fan club's song, which pays tribute to the Noodle Vision TV show. And all you gave me was lyrics, obviously. There's no tune. So I had to make up a tune and also make it sound like these really enthusiastic young fans were singing this song. Uh, and it was just so much fun. I played it to my wife and she said to me, you're keeping that. Promise me you're keeping that audio. I love that. Oh, no, that. It, it, so. it was brilliant. In the middle of it all was a group of kids wearing their official Noodle Vision fan club berets, decorated with an assortment of merit badges. They were standing in a circle, holding hands, and singing the Noodle Vision theme song. I went in your ear, came out your nose, now I'm sticky, that's the way it goes. Noodle, noodle, yeah, yeah, noodle, noodle, oh, noodle vision, hey, hey, noodle vision, oh. Got in your head, adventures, here we go. It may sound crazy, but it's the greatest show. Noodle, noodle, yeah, yeah, noodle, noodle, low. Noodle vision, hey, hey, noodle vision, ho. Noodle vision TV show, episode one. It says it's written by Elamando Soso. Now, he's one of the characters in the book. Why did you decide to credit the one of the characters as the author rather than yourself? Well, because um, the book began um, through my marketing agency that I owned years ago. Um, I own a different company now. And um, it was one of these highly creative, just amazing experiences because I had worked for corporate America before and these people were just bouncing off the walls with creativity. And so we created kind of like this little haven. And through that, um, we explored all sorts of different subjects, mostly children's creativity, you know, through the clients that we worked with, like Nickelodeon and, and, and Disney and things like that. And um, the book was actually written mostly by my partner at the time, who's still a dear friend, and um, the rest of the team. And we would create ideas and things like that around it. And so um, Elementor just seemed like the perfect representation of all that creativity and the fact that um, though it was authored um, mostly by one or two people, the idea behind it was generated by all of these creative souls who, as you know, um, true creativity comes from the childlike wonder that you're able to retain. And as yeah. an adult, the more you can retain that, even in a professional world like marketing, um, that's the source, right? You know, yeah. with marketing, yeah. you have to realize it's also a business, but you can never damper or um, distract from the fact that true creatives come from that place. And so, yeah. anyway. The best, the best so ideas always come when it stops being work and it starts just being play, that's when exactly. the when you you've got to get to that vibe in it. From many years in radio and from running radio stations, you've got to keep the managers and the salespeople. You've got to keep them out of those creative <laughs> meetings. You've just <laughs> got to have. I mean, you can have other people in there. You can have station engineers and 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 people from the office and the reception. You can get all them in as long as they're there to have fun. And just to enjoy throwing things around, it'll work. But the minute you start getting serious people who are trying to, you know, attach profit and loss to things, that's when it goes wrong. So I get it. I, I get exactly what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why they say, you know, um, working with creators is like hurting kittens. And it really is because they're all kind of damaged and you know, they deal yeah. with them a whole bunch of different ways. And um, I remember <laughs> I had this one administrative assistant and she's like, Wendy, we should be conducting drug tests on these individuals as a corporate <laughs> policy. And I said, Francine, if we did that, like no one would be working for us. <laughs> I mean, not that all creators take drugs, but you know, yeah. it's just, they're, they cope in so many different ways with the realities of the world. Um, yeah. Because that's not the source of creativity, in my opinion. Um, so anyway, so Alamander Soso was 
enigmatic and um, and you and how you voiced him was really the key for me to select you as the talent for this because he had to be perfectly voiced. That um, chaos and tension between would this guy kill me in a you know <laughs> dark alley? <laughs> Maybe, <laughs> but also like inspirationally uh aspirationally creative to kind of give that nod and that permission of yes you dear child can explore your creativity and and a lot of alamander to me is based in like real old school um like the wizard of oz series which a lot of people haven't read the entire series like i am devoted to those books um Tim Burton-esque. Um, certainly there's a little Harry, Harry Potter doc, darkness in there too. And and so um, for me, he was really kind of the key, even though he's not like the main, you know, he's not the main voice character in the whole thing, but he truly is the conductor to that orchestra of the adventure and just the creativity that happens as she figures it out, you know. Yeah, it is quite an adventure is the only way to describe it. And I'm quite I'm surprised to learn that. So was was Elamanda was was he created first then in this marketing environment? Um, and then well, the story based using him as a character in the story is that I'm trying to I'm trying to work out how the marketing thing because what was it a commercial originally? Just what? How did it? Because it is a fabulous kids book. It's yeah, yeah, book. yeah. No, I mean, and the concept happened way before what you see right now. I mean, you know, um, our agency, which was called Curiosity, like we had to explain to clients what content meant. You know, now it's all about content. Um, so he predates a lot of that. But um, he he just became sort of the the guide to any child and that experience. And that's the whole premise of the books moving forward is, as with creativity, um, any child can experience something totally different in a totally different world. And this is what I love about creativity is that um, it's a it's a time machine. Like you could go back, you know, to the to Henry VIII if you wanted and ex have that experience, or you it could be some kind of mashup. Um, and so, uh, so he really I think it did begin with him as how do you guide these different experiences and different imaginations? Because that could be, you know, as unique as the stars. So, um, but, uh, you know, the first, uh, uh, the first character was definitely sort of an introduction of, okay, what would be the worst possible person to put in this situation? <laughs> one who yeah. hates this more than anything else and um i don't want to give too much away but for anybody watching this who, who maybe hasn't read or listened to the book and and you know that that's quite possible because we're trying to promote the, the book and the audio book it's about a tv show quite an outrageous tv show but the person that ends up on the show is someone who absolutely hates the show yeah <laughs> <laughs> Poor thing. And <laughs> you know, so where, you know, everyone's delighted, you know, she's just like horrified, like, you know, because, and again, probably another analogy for a lesson. And this is what I love about the books is, um, as with the Wizard of Oz or any of those books that really, whether that's Narnia or, you know, um, the witch in the wardrobe or the rabbit hole or whatever, like, you know, to release your imagination and um, look at the world in the weird in different ways that you can. And particularly because we're based in Portland, Oregon, which is just a weird little town, you know what I mean? And people really embrace that idea of nonconformity here. And so um, the opposite of that is to always be perfect and to always have everything, you know, lined up, checked off, you know, never a foot wrong. And, um, and that's just particularly for children, really restrictive. And um, all the nonsense we get through social media and that kind of thing can, can kind of be that brace. But 
also as adults, and that's what I love about the book, is I think as an adult, you could read it and enjoy it um, as well. And and there's lessons there, you know, if you want to, or you can just be entertained. But, um, but yeah, the idea that these, you know, and that's what's so lovely about Big Chicken and, and Elementor Soso is that they have a very deep, as you can tell, and dedicated uh, idea about these children and guiding them, protecting them just enough, but not so much that they don't skin the knee, you know, and make mistakes. Um, but they're also like highly commercial and <laughs> like, yeah, he's a businessman. <laughs> <laughs> there's little commercial interstitials throughout the book and there's big chicken, like Hawk and his, you know, album, you know, and it's just, it's that level of sense of humor, which is, you know, also such a key part. But it keeps create. you guessing about him too, about his mm -hmm. intentions. You yes. think, you know, is he just a money grabber or does he have a higher purpose here with this thing? And all mm -hmm. the way through, you're asking yourself that question, which I thought was quite clever. Mm. Yeah. And sort of like you see Steve McQueen above me. You know, I don't think he he cares. You know, and that's what makes <laughs> him so like, I think that's why people crave. And at least in the storyline of Anna Alamander so so is like they realize that, you know, he's just going to go his own way. Like he is the true definition of anarchy. You know yeah. what I mean? Like yeah. you don't want to bet against him. You don't want to root for him. You kind of want to root for him. Like, you know, because he wins, you know, kind of the scenario of he's cool like that. Um, because you know he's on his own path and yeah. um and sometimes that's a dark one and sometimes that's a really aspirational one and i i love i love that message um and even my you know my own children like that's always been kind of the thing of like find the path that rings true it with your intuition and so how and old I feel are like your children Oh, my son, he just turned 31 and my daughter is 25. Okay, so, right. So yeah. have they got kids now? No, no, they don't. Okay, so you don't really have sample children to test this out on within the family, <laughs> close family. <laughs> no, not the close family. Oh, I do have um, uh, nieces and nephews who have children. And so, and they really, really love the book. They and do. that's kind of like. They, that's great. kind of what we've been yeah. getting to like it's being sold on amazon is that you know um particularly and I'm, I'm really i think this book is for anyone i really do just based off the premise but it's i think even grown-ups too there's a lot in there yeah yeah no exactly i think it's engaging little boys in a way who yeah. i find to be a lot harder to kind of get in touch with you know those feelings of you know, exploration, imagination, that kind of thing sometimes. And okay. so that's really exciting to see that in the reviews. So, so yeah, so my nephews like, or my great nephews really dig it. So. Great. And Portland, why is Portland so, so different? Cause it, for anyone who doesn't know where, where Oregon is, it's kind of, it's, it's in the, the Pacific Northwest, isn't it? It's just mm -hmm. below Washington state, just above California. And yes. I've not been to, I've been to California many times and I've been to Washington state, but I've not mm -hmm. actually been to Oregon. So why is Portland so different? Because you, you hear people from Texas talk about Austin being different right. to the rest of right. Texas. Is it, is Portland typical of, of Oregon or is it, a, is it another Austin kind of situation going on here? You know, um, politically it carries the state. Um, but there's a lot of kind of conservative pockets in and around Oregon. But so it's um, quite a liberal you, town, then. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. And you have Eugene, yeah. which is also fairly liberal, Corvallis. So um, that's why you see its politics go the way it does. But um, Portland, I don't know. I just think people realize that we were kind of off the map, off the grid for a really, really long time. Like you know, California and all the Silicon Valley billionaires are getting all the attention, and obviously the movie stars. And you have Washington now with Microsoft, and you know that's kind of a little bit of a hub there as well. Um, Bowie, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, I mean, and not that we're not you know a big grown up town, but you can walk Portland like. <laughs> 25 30 minutes across town a lot of people actually compare it to european cities because it has like cobblestone streets and things like that but i just think the general feeling is um there's so much diversity of thought that um people just kind of like dig the idea that they're weird and that's okay with them you know what i mean <laughs> 
<laughs> like we have the trailblazers, which is a basketball team, but we don't, we're not like a major, like we don't have a major football team. We don't do that kind of, kind of standard stuff. Um, we don't have a sales tax, you know, um, it's just, and you know, which drives me crazy because we could be making a lot of money off of, especially tourists, but no, no, no one will ever vote for that because that's just Oregon. <laughs> so I, I, I think when you look at the city and it's kind of like a mix of really old, old buildings, um, you know, it's a little bit of a magical world of that, you know, a little bit of high tech, but not a whole lot. I don't know. I, I just find it to be a very comfortable place to be strange. Oh, comfortable place to be strange. Okay. <laughs> and and did you grow up there? Are you, are you native? Mm -mm, no, um, California, the Bay Area. Okay. So right in the heart of Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. And how so, did you find yourself in Portland? A boy. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my wife ended up in the UK. I met her in New Zealand. So, did yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that happens. Yeah. It does. Yeah. And when you were growing up, what kind of stuff were you reading as a kid? You mentioned Wizard oh, of Oz. Yeah, you know, well, um, my parents were really young when they were married. And so they yeah. put themselves through college, um, you know, around their 20s. And we were little then and um, didn't have a lot of money. And so my a big treat, my mom would take me to the university library, which I know sounds weird when you're like, you know, eight but um it was like a candy store to me and um she was always into uh british history um so you know i like i read war and peace when i was like eight you know i was just constantly like reading and reading and reading and and certainly the oz books i, I would say have the number one impact um and um certainly books like uh you know um Alice in Wonderland, uh, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah. You know, where there was, you know, in the Oz books, it, a lot of female protagonists, you know. Yeah. And, and you read his story, which is really amazing. Um, again, some guy, you know, I don't know, he was working marketing or whatever, and he, he wrote a book and, and finally got attention and just kind of took off. And But um, and certainly society wasn't with him on that. You know what I mean? He just kind of came up with it. Um, I um, I just think that reading in general is where we get some of those earliest memories. Yeah. And I, if I had to make one commentary on what makes me sad is the lack of that encouragement um, or the substitution of social media and little blurbs, you know, somehow being truths or whatever. When if we really read history and we look at what happens, you know, you can see the patterns in the world, you know, and, and, and kind of piece that together and realize that what we are isn't as unique as we think. It's just in a, a different time where information is sped up. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, so I, I personally am not huge on social media just because, you know, Reading what someone ate that day isn't like that exciting to me <laughs> or yeah. some of the information I get. So I tend to be more of a researcher and a seeker, um, which is if you have a curious mind is, is what you are. You're a seeker. For me, I, for me, there, there's too many branches of social media. It's like when MySpace came along, I wasn't interested. And then Facebook came along and I wasn't interested. And then I was at a radio convention and they said, you know, you really should be getting into Twitter. And I thought, okay. So I got into Twitter. And then now it's like, you should be an Instagram and you should be. And I've just stuck with Twitter. I don't want, I, I'll do one and that's it, you know. But I wish they'd combine them. I wish they'd combine, you know, YouTube, Spotify, Twitter, Facebook, you know, just, just, Combine them all into one giant time-wasting website and call it You Spotty Twit Face or something. You know, just <laughs> just so you had one place. It's bothered me that it's splintered and I, I can't keep You're up not with doing them. TikTok dances or anything. No, no, TikTok is the new one. Yeah, now it's like you got it. You're supposed to be on. Yeah, it was like probably six months ago. It was Instagram. Now it's it's TikTok. It's like, oh, just leave me alone. I'll just stick with Twitter. So I just stuck with one because 
I have to stick my toe in, but I'm really not that interested. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, that's what I studied in school was storytelling and broadcasting and speech communications, things like that. And I always got into the philosophy of it, you know, McClellan, those guys, McLuhan, um, you know, Edward R. Murrow, like just huge heroes. Um, but, you know, you look at the, since caveman days, and paintings on the walls and the need to tell stories um, yeah, and you know, kind of how it's been washed and processed through the media age of the internet and social media and stuff like that. And in some ways, and we saw this, you know, when we had the marketing agency, you have people who want to be professionals at telling those stories. And what technology has done is given them the tools to do yeah. that, you know, because I don't know how to design, I don't know how to write or what you, whatever, you know what I mean? And so it's kind of stepping up and, and, and using those tools and the people who use them and break them are the ones who reinvent the next set of tools to do that. So you might get your wish. I mean, it might all kind of get combined. <laughs> <at some point. laughs> just, that would be the next generation. I keep thinking about that with like DoorDash, which just, you know, delivers food. I don't know if that's what it's called in the UK, but but we um, do have them. We have uh, Just Eat and uh, Deliveroo. And yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 And I keep thinking like, well, the next iteration is I want spaghetti from that restaurant and Thai from that restaurant. You know what I mean? And dessert I, from this restaurant. Yes, yeah. Right. <laughs> and now they're starting to do that, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So I, I'm fascinated by how stories get told. It's, you know, something, like I said, I've studied for a long time and at, sometimes I'm horrified by it, but, um, but I support the creative thought that goes behind it. Um, you know, what I'm trying to, what, if I had one thing personally that I really try to um, think about a lot is capitalism and like monetizing and that kind of thing. And I think that's where you can break down a lot of creativity starting where you were with the keeping the ad guys out of the creative room. You know what I yeah. mean? I, yeah. That, that makes me sad sometimes where it's like, I don't really care about this, but I'm going to make a buck, you know, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I had I one experience and it, it made me change my mind. It was a, a radio station in Bournemouth and uh, I wanted, it's a seaside town and it's, a, you know, a lot of holiday makers and day trippers come down there. And I said, OK, we're going to put everybody in the room. We're just looking for ideas. There's no bad ideas. We're looking for ideas of stuff we can do on the radio station in summer. And who knows, we might get three or four great ideas. We might get a hundred that we don't like, but they, mm -hmm. the three or four we get might be brilliant. And we came up with um, with an idea um, and the sales guy in the room, because I didn't know at this stage to keep those people out of the room. He just said, <laughs> he just said, well, how am I supposed to make money out of that? And we're like, That's not what we were looking for. We were looking just to have fun and to do something on the radio station that people would talk about and would market the radio. But unless they can see a, 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 a profit and loss and a... And a you, you, we're trying to we're trying to create something here. You can't put a price on, and that's well, what it's about. Well, that's what you know gets back behind to Noodle Vision is just you know the exploration of your own creativity and imagination and just having fun with that idea instead of like and you know again kids are were marketed to when we were little, but now they're marketers themselves. You know what I mean? And at some point, yes, you know, um, that really breaks that cycle of just exploring and being weird and funny and believing in your own unique weirdness to sort of like differentiate yourself versus trying to look like everybody else on Instagram, you know, yeah. you know, and, yeah. um, and so, you know, that, you know, that there's no real political leaning about the book, but if it does that kind of thing, if it helps kids get back to that, place um i'm really i'd be really pleased if it did that um, it, it does because the the invited guests or the contestants or whatever you'd call them on noodle vision on the noodle vision tv show i mean what happens there is quite intrusive i mean they go inside their mind so it's it's not science fiction it is a kid's fun book but were you worried that that could turn slightly dark? Because they because they turn out going it going into their mind not just as as voyeurs, but for a reason. Were you worried that that it would be seen as kind of almost like a horror tale? 
you know, it, yeah, I mean, well, that's the idea, and that's what Alamander represents to me. Is you push it just to the point right before that happens. You know what I yeah. mean? Um, yeah. And so, you know, I don't ever see him crossing that line, but no. um, the fact that he could is, is I think, what it makes him even more mysterious. And With great power comes great responsibility. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes he does have that. It was such That's a fun... The book is like, it talks about like all these secret agencies, you know, MI6, you know, uh, the current, you know, Okrana, you know, <laughs> um, FBI, you know, they all want this, how he does it. And like somehow yeah. he's able to yeah. you know, keep. Because it's the number one TV show in the world and mm -hmm. all the kids watching it has all this influence and it's selling products commercially in between the show as well. But then what he's really up to is actually quite noble in the end yes. as you as you find out which is which is great especially with it being a kids book um but it uh it it, it straddles that line between being very real about the human condition in some way and also being this this fantasy with these larger than life characters so it was a wonderful book to narrate because you know you've got to get that message across but also they could have so much fun with these characters and, and and I think my favorite bit was near the beginning of the book there is a fan club for the show that has a meeting mm -hmm. and they have to sing the the song of the fan club song which pays tribute to the Noodle Vision TV show and all you gave me was lyrics obviously there's no tune so I had to make up a tune and also make it sound like these really enthusiastic young fans were singing this song. Uh, and it was just so much fun. I played it to my wife and she said to me, you're keeping that. Promise me you're keeping that audio. I love that. Oh, no, that. It, it, so. it was brilliant. And that's the thing is, is that, I mean, you in particular, um, you know, as a creative and, um, you know, I, I work with a lot of, um, creatives now, uh, and you need to give them direction. And, um, a, you know, an okay creative will, well, a bad creative will copy an idea out, right? An okay creative will take an idea and add their own little spin to it. You know, it's fine. Um, really good creativity is when you take that idea, you turn it upside down, and then you start like thinking like it, where you're going to take that. And, um, and so when I give directions to the creatives I work with right now, um, you know, there's a, there's a core strategy always, uh, whether it's a sales one or whatever, like there's data behind that, right? Um, but you want them to interpret what you're giving them in a way that's genuine and authentic. And that's where you see the real love in the art come from. And so, um, you Well, know, that's where the I'm playing all... begins, because you're just exactly. playing. Yeah. And I'm... I'm always like, okay, you know, as long as the core of, of why that is happening is intact, if your interpretation is like, you know, you know, not what I imagined, that's okay because, you know, I'm getting a contact high off of your creativity, right? <laughs> and like, and that's exactly what you were with the book, like in the voices. And I was like, this guy is really enjoying this to a degree <laughs> of actually adding his own little magic. And, and that's what I love about the creative experience is, you know, I always picture that painting where God is touching man, right? Like in the hands and the Sistine, Sistine Chapel. Chapel. Yeah. 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 And, because creativity to me is one hand touching another across time, you know, and we're all influenced and inspired by things that have happened, you know, in front of us or behind us. And, um, but, uh, you know, that's kind of like what makes it even better, um, in my opinion, is the collaborative nature of all of that. And, um, and again, like, you know, it's kind of an, an underlying message because it's a children's story, but you see Megan like going, or, you know, um, Millie going through her story and she is constantly having to collaborate, you know, to, to get yes. where she to go. And, yeah. um, and clearly against her own better judgment you know, in some cases, <laughs> but, um, but at some point she realizes that the perfect world that she's created, uh, 
doesn't allow, would never allow her to um, get through that experience. You know, she just kind of stuck to her guns and, and, and held fast to those ideals. And so, and that's what great creativity does is it, uh, it challenges us as well as it amuses or um, entertains us. But, yeah. um, but you and your voicing and all the characters, and I was just like, okay, this has now gotten to another place, right? <laughs> and I myself was enjoying it as a new kind of viewer to the whole experience of the book. Like, you know, you just took it to another place. So, yeah. Well, I'm thank really... you for that. It was so much fun to do. Thank you for choosing me as the narrator. And this is episode one. Will there be episode two anytime soon? Yes. No, we're, we're, we're currently outlining like where to go next. And that's kind of part of the, um, the challenge of, of the whole thing, because, you know, it's great. <laughs> you have to nail it down to one direction you know what I mean? because it's endless. Like, it, you know, you could, you could take this anywhere. Um, but, you know, um, we want to explore, you know, different kids, boys, girls, you know, um, the whole gamut of, you know, experiences and, um, and different times and places or, you know, environments and things like that. And so, um, and that's what I, that's what I love about it. It's, it's just, it's almost too much fun to think about, you know, where you take it next. So. Who can I hear in the background? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that is my African gray parrot. Oh, and, uh, She's, uh, she's what, 16 years old. And, um, again, according, according to, um, her backstory, um, she loves game of games of Thrones. Um, she thinks she's a dragon. Um, so she's constantly crying out, you know, dragon birdie, you know, <laughs> <laughs> she has a crush on my 31 year old son. So she has to yeah, call, call him every day. And, so, you know, again, like, you know, she and I will sing and dance a lot. She, um, she likes all sorts of music, but usually something that has a good soul beat to it. You know, she's kind of, you know, gangster you'll like have, that. You'll have to put her in one of the books one day. <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, in my own world, like, I, I like to live in, like, you know, kooky, like, oh, she's, um, she's a you know, capitalist billionaire who owns all this money because she's been scamming off our companies all these years. And, you know, we have a whole <laughs> story going around her. But yeah, no, she's quite a character. Great. Okay. Well, the book is called Noodle Vision TV Show, or The Noodle Vision TV Show, Episode 1, Trouble in Perfection. It's mm -hmm. a kid's book, but there's a lot in it for anyone of any age. There's fabulous characters. There's a great story. And it, it keeps, it never, it never lets up. Just where you think you figured it out, there's another twist. And, but it stays within the, the context of the story. And the, and the, when I was narrating it, the, the one word that, that kept coming to my mind was like, was color. Because there's like this vivid, um, if that makes sense, there's a vivid color to the way it's written and the way it comes across, like multicolored. Um, just just amazing uh, uh and i love it i love it a lot and and even if i hadn't narrated it i'm sure i would like it if you'd like to get yours all the links are in the description if you're watching this on youtube uh check it check it out there all the links to everything you need to download it there um it's called the noodle vision tv show episode one trouble in perfection wendy flores thank you so much thank you graham and uh I think you're amazing. So thank you for being a fellow creative in my weird little world. So I appreciate it.